Hey, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. It's Saturday morning, my friend, and you are listening to Light Talk. Good morning. This is Stan in Gainesville, Florida. And today on Light Talk, we are discussing that first teaching job, poking holes in your gel <laughs> to not or not to not. <laughs> and paperwork all on Light Talk. And this is David coming to you from the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood of Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk and we are the Lumen Brothers. Well, everyone, welcome to episode 177. And uh, today we're sort of going to start off the show with a little tribute to Hal Binkley. Uh, as many of you know, he, uh, Hal passed last week, uh, actually uh, passed uh, on Friday of last week. And it was a shock to us. We had already recorded the show uh, earlier that week, and uh, we put a little prologue at the top of the show to uh, make the announcement and to give tribute to him. But I think today we just want to talk a little more about what this man meant to our art form. And it's, it's just amazing. I mean, Steve, he's done how many shows on Broadway? I mean, why you, why you tell us the shows he's done? It's like unbelievable list of shows. Sure. These are in no particular order. Um, and we'll start with Ain't Too Proud, Summer, Escape to Margaritaville, Prince of Broadway, Come From Away, A Bronx Tale, The Musical, Cirque du Soleil Paramour, Allegiance, Hamilton, Dr. Zhivago, Honeymoon in Vegas, After Midnight, A Christmas Story, The Musical, Magic Bird, Jesus Christ Superstar, The People in the Picture, Baby It's You, How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying, Colin Quinn, Long Story Short, Lombardi, Million Dollar Quartet, All About Me, Memphis, West Side Story, Guys and Dolls, To Be or Not to Be, Cry Baby, Gypsy, In the Heights, The Farnsworth Invention, Xanadu, Love Music, Bridge and Tunnel, Jersey Boys, Still Magnolias, Dracula the Musical, Bobby Bolin, Golda's Balcony, Avenue Q, The Look of Love, Hollywood Arms, The Full Monty, Gore Vidal's The Best Man, Manelli on Manelli, Parade, High Society, Taking Sides, Sacrilege, My Thing of Love, How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying, The Remount, Grease, Kiss of the Spider Woman. I mean, Kiss of the Spider Woman was the first thing I had seen that Hal did, and it was just stunning. Not to mention the dance work, uh, Parsons Dance, and that he, that he co-founded. I mean, the guy's just <laughs> prolific is an understatement. Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, Steve, how many shows are that? Like 50 or something? Well, I'm, I'd have to go back and look again, but I think for those who are taking notes at home, I think that was 52. Wow. And, you know, l l we're, not, we're not even talking about things that he did right. in the music industry, the dance right. industry, regional theater, television. Right. This is... Uh, Romanian acrobats... My first exposure to Hal Binkley, was writing the Romanian acrobats here at the University of Florida in 1999. That's pretty cool. That's uh, pretty unbelievable. cool. Unbelievable. So, Steve, in that list, I mean, this has been over what, like a 20-year period? I'm wanting to say it began in 1995. Okay. Yeah. So, 25 years. Yeah, he yeah. had Sacrilege, uh, My Thing of Love, How to Succeed in Business. That's amazing. Um you know, all in a year there. And of course, Kiss of the Spider yeah, he, Woman. He was getting hot in the late 90s. That's when I sort of first had my first contact with him. It was like, he was, and it was before Jersey Boys, um, but he was already making such a mark. He won two Tony Awards. I believe it was Jersey Boys and Hamilton. That's right. I think that's right. And it's funny because, you know, I never saw Jersey Boys until I went on a cruise last year and they were running Jersey Boys with his lighting design and it was brilliant on a cruise ship. <laughs> so there you go. I mean, that's pretty amazing. I mean, uh, he really is the Theron Musser of our generation. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I, I really, really think true. so. And I think all the pros and in, in, in his level, which is, you know, the top, obviously, will probably agree with me. Uh, I, I just, uh, 
think that his work is stunning. But even more important was how generous he was and training students and young lighting designers. Trisha Nichols Scalamoni, she was one of Hal's first assistants for many years and was on the lighting team for many years. And I, I spoke to her last night because I really care about this person. She's an amazing, amazing person, always has been. And of course, she's devastated along with all the people who knew him personally. But I asked her to say a few words and or write down a few words. And she said, I'm truly blessed. Hal Binkley and Matt Knudsen shaped me as a designer. By the way, for those who do not know, Matt Knudsen also recently passed. He was an amazing lighting teacher, and he was one of my students, actually, former graduate students. Uh, He used to teach at Western Michigan University and a wonderful person. But anyway, she goes on. She says, Hal Binkley and Matt Knudsen shaped me as a designer and more importantly, as a person. I am who I am today because of them. In hearing stories of both of them, they both took deep interest in the people in their worlds, creating a -a one-of-a-kind relationship with each of them. No two were alike. I am honored to have sat at the table next to Howell for so many years. Uh, And then I asked her to kindly tell some advice that she heard Howell give students, and of course her, and she said, see theater often, be inspired by art often. There's always an open seat at the tech table. Don't be afraid to ask to join a designer during tech to observe. Here's one of my favorites. Close your computer, put down your device, and watch the stage. Paper and pencil works just as well. And and this is amazing. Always remember, it's about the people you're in the room with. Build those relationships and keep them strong. On Jersey Boys, which was his first Tony, uh, one of our alumni was also on that team, uh, Sarah Maines, then Sarah Condit, who worked with Trisha. And uh, years ago, I asked Sarah, hey, can I get those light plots so I can <laughs> show my students what a really professional, excellently drawn light plot looks like? And she talked to Hal and talked to Trisha, and they were gracious enough to share some prints with me. And I've been using those in class as a role model uh, ever since. And... Um, just thinking about what he did for her and her career and um, it's hard. Yeah, it's hard. It's, it's, it's hard. It's hard. He's a, he's a giant. And as many of you know, we had him booked to, uh, uh, to be on our show this, uh, this year. And uh, it's a shame that we're not going to be able to obviously do this, but um, I think he's left his mark. Too soon, though. I will say too soon. 64. Uh, he had so much more to give, but you know something? He gave more than most. You know, something about him, that I don't remember if I, how I learned this, but he talked about, he, he uh, started out at East Carolina University, um, where a friend of mine taught years ago, and, and he talked about doing load-ins. I mean, that's how he got started, um, and he wasn't a white glove designer. He, 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 he sort of was obviously working at the top of the field and wasn't hanging lights on Broadway, but he sort of under, he sort of start, he came up through the ranks and I have a lot of respect for that. And I think that sort of also gives an added flavor to the quality of your work. It was funny there. I think there was a faux pas in the playbill uh, piece that they published about him because they used the word technician. And I thought, you know, he's a design, lighting designer and one of the most, you know, blah, 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 lighting technicians on Broadway. And I thought, well, maybe in some ways he was also a technician, but the artistry is, is, uh, stands head and shoulders and everybody wanted, there's a Hal Binkley way of doing it and everybody wanted and everybody looked at, just like you say, you know, Jennifer Tipton gave us certain things, Theron Mustard did, I, Hal's given us yeah. a style that's his own that we all sort of absorb. And I think the one thing that strikes me is, Hal's signature is his cueing, is his mm-hmm. transitions. He does totally transitions agree. like no one else does. Yeah. Uh, and, and they are elaborate and perfect. They're absolutely perfect. I mean, I've never seen such great builds and buttons and things like that. And, you yeah. know, and, and just these multi-layered pull downs and how the space will change shape within a matter of seconds in multifaceted ways. It's just mind blowing and never distracting. 
Yeah, on the cueing piece, can I say that there's also this thing, I think it's a howl thing where in the music, when the music sort of swells and rises, the light sort of comes up with it and then it slowly backs off of it. Right. It's just like that, that he's riding the wave of the energy of the show <laughs> with the light. And I just love it. Yeah. I like that. Riding the wave. That's fantastic. All right. Well, thank you, Howell, and God bless you. And, uh, Rest in peace. So let's get started with the show. Steve has our first question. It comes from Jean in Paris. And Jean writes, have you ever heard of tying knots in your feeder cable? <laughs> well, what type yes, of knots? Square knots? <laughs> slip knots? <laughs> garlic knots? <Well. laughs> oh, I think I know what he means now. I just realized. Let's see if I'm right. Well, I think um, what you're referring to, Jean, is uh, something that's done primarily in the film industry. You know, people use sash cord and they tie knots on their feeder cable. Uh, again, you see this, this old timers in, in film do it. Uh, in the theater, we have color coded cam locks and we also have color tape to indicate the three hots, the neutral and the ground. But, but there was a time before multicolored tape and cam locks. So the clever gaffer used sash cord and knots to label the feeder. So hot one, which is black, they would tie two knots on one end of the feeder. Hot two, which is red, uh, one knot on one side of the feeder. And hot three, which is blue, there would be no knots on that cable. Neutral white had a knot on either end of the feeder. And ground green, two knots on each side of the feeder. So I think that's what you're referring to. That's not what I was thinking, but I just learned something. Is that so they could know in the dark? Why is it in the dark? <laughs> Turn on the lights if you're working with electricity, damn it. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, make sure you got the right line and there's no lights yeah, on. Exactly. <laughs> anyway, B in Colorado writes, I am starting my first teaching job in a few weeks. Any advice? <laughs> Run away! Get, <laughs> out, we, get out now! <laughs> <laughs> what would you tell your younger self just starting out? Well, I don't even remember my younger self. And my first teaching job was actually at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. I came in for one year uh, guest uh, teacher uh, for their graduate program because Joe Appelt was uh, he was the teacher there for many years, and he had to be chair, so they brought brought someone in, and someone foolishly suggested me to be the teacher, even though I'd never taught before, and uh, and I thought it'd be hey, why not? Let's let's have some fun, and uh, that's my advice. Let's have some fun. Uh, teaching is a blast. Uh, it is uh, you know you get to make a difference, so it's it, it, you're actually doing something valuable for the community and for the world, and you're helping people realize their dreams. So, okay, <laughs> it's not that easy. <laughs> Sounds really romantic the it's way very, you put it. I'm, I'm being really overly romantic here. But, you know, something, I've been doing it, I don't know how many years now, about 30 years. It's like crazy. But um, I, advice, do not make enemies. Uh, don't get involved in politics. If you are, that's very difficult. Don't get involved in politics. Uh, just because Never start a land war in Asia. <laughs> <laughs> From the Princess Bride, by the way. Good, good quote. Uh, and uh, I just think that you try to help everybody around you. It's hard, and it's really hard if you have a professional career also, especially if you're a young teacher on tenure track. And I've said this before on the show, you got to make sure you get an agreement with the dean and everybody in, on board that you're going to continue that and you figure out a way to balance it with your responsibilities at school because people can take advantage of it. You just have to really be careful about it. That's the trickiest part. Were there anything that, like, I think you asked, what would you tell your younger self just starting out? I, you know, I just had fun. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I was, you know, I was a rookie, but I just decided to go in there and talk to the students and of course, make sure you have good lesson plans and, and, um, and try to inspire them to, you know, take the bull by the horns and find out what your passion is and follow it. And like Hal Binkley said, call the, uh, the designers, you know, show up at the theater and uh, ask if you could sit at the table. It's all they could say is no. And I don't think of any professional designer that I know who wouldn't say, hey, can we get another headset for Diane here? 
I mean, that's really what it's all about because these people are good people. They want to give back. So uh, I like the part about what would you tell your younger self just starting out? And I wish, so I'm going to make, confess that there's something I, I would tell my younger self now that I think didn't help me when I was a young teacher. I would say, young Stan, don't, don't worry so much about being liked by your students. Uh, it's more important to be respected by your students. And I think the mistake that I made, because when you're young, you're not that far away from the age of your students. And there's a tendency to allow for a closeness and a, a intimacy, which can be good. And intuitively, that feels right. However, when you need some distance, you, you might not want to acknowledge the fact when you're a young teacher that you are the authority figure. And sometimes if you are too close, too nice, too liked, when you need to sort of uh, invoke some rigor in the training, you might not be able to. So it's easy to be come the student's friends after the professional relationship is forged. It's really hard to sort, of, to sort of impose rigor on somebody who you've made your friend. So I wish someone had told me that when I was first starting out. Well, I would say after every class, go to your office and look at your lecture notes and, and honestly evaluate it. What worked in class today? What didn't work? Why did it not work? And start fixing what you did that day. Don't wait until the end of the school year and then start going, well, I think I'll look at my lesson plan, you know, 30 weeks ago. Address it every day. And if you do that for a couple of years, you're going to be pretty solid in what you're presenting. And you're also going to figure out these failures, how to turn them around. You know, the biggest mistake is going to class and you're not really prepared. You think there's going to be an hour of lively discussion and questions. So, I mean, if you prepare for five minutes of class, that's what you're going to have that day. <laughs> so you, need, you right. need to come in there, you know, loaded for bear. Hmm. Boy, I tell you, B, you got some great advice from three old teachers here. <laughs> Listening to my colleagues, it's pretty amazing. But, yeah, I mean, just listen and uh, stay out of trouble and have fun. <laughs> keep, you know, keep in touch with your, your old teachers and, and reach out yeah, to them. Yeah. Um, there's, there's usefulness there. So uh, Warren in Ohio uh, writes, what is the most enjoyable part of the lighting paperwork process for you, Stan, Steve, <laughs> Stan. and David? None of it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't like any of it. <laughs> you, know, I, I, so I, you know, I think back to like... Um, when I had to write my hookup sheets by hand and I would make the template with a ruler and, and a protractor and then I would go to the, the Mimeo machine and I'd make <laughs> copies of the blanks and then I'd crap. fill them in. I mean, who likes that? I mean, I didn't care for that. I, but I do have a favorite or I do have an, I think. So, you know, the light plot back in the day when I would do it real lightly in pencil and then come back with ink and make an inked plot so the print would look beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I really liked as an, as an artist was two things. I like going through the script the first time, or the, actually the second time. The first time, I just read it. The second time with my pencil and putting in where I think there's cues or mood changes or feelings and sort of kind of sketching it in and then letting my imagination roll with what it might be because I haven't seen blocking yet or, or, or anything like that. And then the other part is later in the process when I have seen rehearsal and the light plot's done and the paperwork's done and all the, and maybe hopefully my trusty assistant has done all the mundane stuff that I don't like. And I sit down and I make the magic sheet, whether it's, whether it's with my old colored pencils and my little shape template and making little arrows and starting to see what my palette's going to be and what cap you know, what kinds of things I have to work with, uh, that piece. And or if it's now in, in EOS and I'm doing it electronically, that part is really fun because it's both, it's like making the thing. I think David posted Howl's magic sheets and that got me thinking about that, how they're works of art in themselves just to look at them. They're so cool. But then also what they evoke in my imagination and that sort of seeps in what my lighting design is going to be capable of. So the magic sheet for me is probably really high up there on 
the the pro- paperwork process that I enjoy. Well, like I said, I don't like any of it. <laughs> I mean, I started out doing a lot of paperwork because I was an assistant for many years. And, uh, and of course, it was all done by hand. Um, but uh, yeah, I, there's very little that I enjoy because to me, it's, you know, other than the light plot and the section, it's not really creative. The light plot and the section is, you know, you're getting, figuring out angles and directions and things like that. And uh, that's really important, obviously. But... Uh, the rest is all numbers that relate to each other. And I just, you know, even, I'm reaching out psychically to you right now. Can you feel me penetrating uh, your you're brain? You're penetrating with my psych- the brain. Okay. You know, I feel no. magic sheet there. I, 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 I feel I, magic no, sheet. No, I feel, no, I, I, I think, no? I think we share the same favorite part of paperwork. Throwing it away that, at the end. Taking our <laughs> check to the bank and depositing it. <laughs> yeah, the check in the bank. That's good. Uh, you're right. I do enjoy that part. Well, you are listening to Light Talk, and Light Talk is sponsored by Tally Bally Ho. Here comes the cheeky rigor Asia. How many times have you been on a call, broken for lunch, only to discover cold pizza and disappointing pasta waiting for you in the break room? Worse still, sometimes it's a third rate sandwich and a fruit cup salad. From the local grocery. As a busy stagehand, you deserve better. You deserve the very best in food. What to do, kittens? Pack your lunch. You ask for it, the Cheeky Rigor Asia delivered four new food treats for 2020. Let's start with raw chicken sashimi. (laughs) If you like sushi, you will love raw chicken sashimi. While eating raw chicken is considered an absolute no-go in Europe and America... In Japan, raw chicken is fairly common, perfect for the stage hand who has no time to cook. Once you get used to the taste, it ain't that bad. <laughs> Leave this in your locker all day. Ooh. One bite goes a long way and you can chew on it all day long. With the industry shut down, perhaps you have spent a little too much time watching HBO and have put on a few extra pounds. Then you need a big dish of natu. Natu is a go-to traditional Asian dish consisting of fermented beans. It's low-cal and slimy (laughs) with a strong and distinct flavor. It is easily recognized by its repugnant taste, (laughs) smell, and texture. Some have compared the smell to rotten cheese or stinky feet. No No second helpings for you, Tubby, and your breath will be unforgettable. But perhaps you're a little adventurous. Then you should consider Funazushi. <laughs> That's right. I'm talking about fermented <laughs> carp. Crap? Oh, carp. Okay, carp. <laughs> Got it. That's oh, right. Boy. I'm talking about fermented carp <laughs> taking more than a year to prepare and ripen. Put that in your mouth and let it melt. Oh, Hang on a minute. We can't forget dessert. You can ease that sweet tooth of yours by reaching for a serving of butt pudding. <laughs> Picture in your mind a scheming little boy who is delighted by mooning people. That's what a bowl of butt pudding looks like. (laughs) Now you can bring the full moon to the comfort of your own kitchen with this weirdly appetizing vanilla and cinnamon butt pudding. Single serve mold not enough? Ask about our sumo size mold (laughs) so everyone on the crew can get a mouthful. In your face, pet sweat, (laughs) the cheeky rigor Asia. We make underwear too. Oh, God. You know, you know, all of that is actual food in Japan. I, I know. Is butt, is every is butt one pudding of those real? Butt pudding. I've had butt pudding. When I was in Japan, I had this. Um, Picture you know, a little mound of uh, vanilla pudding, and then down the middle of it is a little streak of cinnamon. Very nice. So it's very it's, nice. It's mooning. Yeah, very nice. That's uh, that's that's attractive. I'll have to have it when I have to have it when I get to Japan. <laughs> so I'm going on the bucket list. <laughs> so, now, so, so now you've got butt pudding and spotted dick on your list. Right. Oh, boy. That's, that's okay. Oh man. Oh boy. <laughs> okay, where's my line? And now back to light talk. <laughs> and now and now back to light talk. <laughs> Well, the sounds of those crazy ducks tells us that once again, it's time for Let's Talk About. And today's Let's Talk About segment is titled Time is Precious. 
Actually, this comes from a revisit of the great Hal Binkley webinar about Hamilton that I listened to the other day. I highly recommend you checking it out on livedesignonline.com. One of the many things Hal talked about was that the organization of the show regarding using one programmer, numbering fixtures, and the transfer from one venue to another is primarily due to the goal of saving time. <laughs> you spoke that they went to only one programmer on one console primarily to save time. He found that multiple programmers slowed things down. And, but this brings up a larger issue. Not many students of lighting design realize that they must be able to work fast and efficiently and make changes over rehearsals. I see too many students just taking notes about changes. The and culture of the note. <laughs> the culture of the note. The I note see, culture. <laughs> I see too many. I hate it. <laughs> I see notes. Too many. <laughs> notes are a last resort. <laughs> okay. Okay. You know, I, well, we'll get to that in a second. But anyway, I see too many students taking notes about changes <laughs> instead of learning how to do it during the rehearsal. Because the fact of the matter is that many times that's the only opportunity you're going to have to make those cue changes. Plus, you have the actors on stage reflecting the light. And if you wait until the note session, if you're fortunate enough to have one, you may be just lighting the floor. Not to right. mention that directors like instant gratification to see their notes on stage without waiting to the next rehearsal. So in my opinion, most universities fail miserably in preparing their lighting designers in adjusting cues in real time over the rehearsals. What do you guys think? I don't think it's. I don't think you can make a broad statement like that. I did. I, <laughs> I, I did can. make the broad yes, statement. I, I mean, you can make <laughs> it. But I don't think I it's agree. accurate. I just did. Oh, you don't I, think I don't it's think, accurate? <laughs> I don't think it's accurate because I think I've seen that. I, it has not always been that way. It's for me. It's a relatively recent phenomenon uh, that this. And, I'm not, and, and I think, David, you have some suspicions about where it comes from, and I think you're right. But I think I, I do, it has not always been that way in academia. I was certainly not taught that. And I've seen it get worse and worse over the last five to seven years. But so it's coming from somewhere else. It's not just the school's the problem. I don't think that's it. So how do you break this problem? I mean, well, I agree with a, you. It's gotten worse and worse over the years. I I'm going to start agree. saying it over and over again. The note is the last resort, not the first resort. Well, back yeah. in the day when they reached for their pad and pencil, you just burn them with a cigarette. <laughs> you know, yeah. Those are the good old days. You can't get away with that anymore. <laughs> well, I think, David, you and I were talking about this, and I think yeah. you, you hit on something. I think it's the rise of the stage manager basically saying, we don't have time for you. And lighting designers not claiming the time that they, that they rightly deserve when the performers and the director are in the room. Well, you know something, stage managers need to get used to it because that's the way it's done in the profession. I, I mean, know that. I mean, as we, of course we do, that, but students don't. And even though you tell a lot of students this, they'll just say, uh, I'll just take the notes. And usually the stage management mentor may want to keep you from doing, keeping the students from doing it. But you know something, they need to learn how to deal with it. Because totally. one thing that I always tell my students is that when, and, and the way I practice it in the profession is when there's a standby, not a warning, but when there's a standby, that's when I record the cue. Yeah, Under exactly. emergencies, if it's something that the director really needs to see or I need to really fix at that moment, I will turn to the director and I'll say, I'm holding the cue. And That's I go, right. I say, and, and when the stage manager says, um, you know, stand by, I'll say, stay here. And then a, that a professional stage manager will say, this is where Q53 would have gone. That's yeah. a, and, and, then, and then when you're finished doing the note, you say, okay, now we'll go into Q53. Right. I think, I think, can I want to add one sure. thing? And then I'm sure Steve wants to jump in. You know, there was an, an article uh, recently written by um, Alan Branton in I forget which magazine, and it was something, he titled it Under Act Actual Field Conditions. And he hammers home this point. So we do have some responsibility, I think, in the way we train our students, and that he says, you have to make decisions, and you have to keep mm -hmm. making decisions. And you can't procrastinate the decision-making, or else you just, you don't move forward. So on our side of the ledger, the stage manager is concerned about getting through the show and moving on. And our students sometimes are just spending way too much time agonizing over a decision. Mm -hmm. So they need to make a decision and move on. And then if the next night that decision didn't work out, then change that decision. But so... There is the clock is ticking and you got to keep the designer does have to keep 
making decisions, but I see a lot of hand wringing. Oh, bring it up to 40. No, 42. No, 44. <laughs> Make a decision and move on. Take it to full. <laughs> yeah, right. And then exactly. take it down. <laughs> yeah, so I think, I think, I think there is something that, that you asked, how do we break it? I think the two pieces that I'm think one the note is your last resort and make decisions keep making decisions that's what you're hired to do right. not to agonize over every little decision you've got to make you've got to keep moving yeah, and what, what are you afraid of if it looks bad then you change it you'll, then you'll okay. change it right it's it's, no it's, we have deal. computers what's the problem <laughs> it's not chiseled in stone right steve um, I, I think I disagree with both of you. Um, <laughs> of course. <laughs> you, you know, uh, all these kind of uh, chest thumping, uh, make a decision stuff, that's fine. But the problem at universities, and that's where it's a problem, yeah. is that uh, the designer, the teacher, unless it happens to be a particularly powerful teacher, uh, uh, kowtows to the acting faculty and kowtows to the, the directing faculty. And all of a sudden, you're in, you're in these endless kind of fantasy paper tech things. Oh, you're doing right. uh, some pre-visualization, which you know, has pros and cons to it, but it comes down to the director. It's not the stage right. manager, it is the director mm -hmm. who does not want to stop for anything. Yeah, and sometimes you have really great directors who are collaborators and they're there to teach, but a lot of times you're working with a director and that is his or her only show that year yeah. or only show every two years. Right. So it is every man for himself. He or she is going to get through that show no matter what it takes. Take a note, take a note. And little, little Timmy there is not about to turn to the faculty director and say, you know, I just need a little time to work on this. Right. And way too often the faculty designer who's sitting in the room doesn't want to say anything either. And so they're saying, well, little Timmy, make a decision, make a decision. Y you know, let's, let's, give, a, let's like give little Timmy or little Debbie a break here. They're in college to learn their profession. They're in, the, they're in the hot seat. Everyone is watching them. All of a sudden, you know, they're, instead of finishing act one that night, they're halfway into it. And all the director is saying is we got to get through the act. we got to get through the act. That's part of it. But uh, I'm not talking about stopping. I'm talking about working over the rehearsal and not stopping because that's what's done. You never stop in the profession unless there's something dangerous happening on stage. If the but these students aren't in the profession yet. Yeah, but they need to they learn are, how to do it. And well, they can't that's, wait. That's, it, that's easy to say, but when you're 19 or 20 years old and you're lighting your first show, you know, you finally got to do your black box show or you finally got to do your proscenium show, there's a ton of pressure on them. It's, it's different. And it's, it's not much better for graduate students. Right. I think Steve's point is, is, is a good one. And I think that there is this thing, I, I was kind of trying to coin a phrase, the directors, many of them, not all, they, they hate tech. They see, they, they view tech as something, oh, I've got to go through tech, as opposed to a joyous, creative not time. Not pros. pros. Pro directors don't hate tech. They I realize that. that's when it happens. I, and they're I, as that's creative the, well, that's, that's as the rub. Else. That's the rub right there. Right. So I have I have colleagues in my institution who love tech and enjoy that process a lot. Most of them have had professional exposure. They weren't actors who became directors. They've actually done that. But I think but I think Steve's point is well taken and giving the students some time. I, 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 I live in that exact moment that he's talking about. Do I stand up and say, no, this student needs some time right now. Right. To work this cue. But if, the, if the, and I can usually get that if my student has come to the table prepared, sometimes they're more prepared and sometimes they're not so prepared. And if they don't come in prepared, then it's a weaker argument. I don't understand right? why you guys don't understand what I'm saying. I'm saying you don't stop the show. You never stop the rehearsal. You work over the rehearsal. You, so you never have Q to Qs? No, the Q to Qs are different. That's different. I'm talking about like over over at the first run through after oh. the Q to Q. Yeah, no, uh, we or, don't or, stop or, that. Or, or over, but, but I'm never talking about stopping the show. You guys keep on saying I'm, you know, that we should never stop the show. I didn't say that. I said you well, need I'm to not, work I'm, over I'm not the disagree. show. I'm not disagreeing with that, but I, the reality of a university is sometimes you have to stop. Of course. Some, sometimes the programmer can't keep up with the designer. Sometimes the designer is sitting there and programming for himself or herself. Right. So, and, you know, and in all fairness to the director, 
I mean, I've heard this like a gazillion times. When I get to tech, I lose the show. Yeah. You know, yep. the, I've been in rehearsal for six to eight weeks. That's right. I've gotten the acting company to a certain level. We get to the theater and everything falls apart for two or three days of tech. Yeah. And then we have to start all over and get that energy with the acting company back up again. Yeah. I've I think it's different. Too. I think in the professional world, you're, you're exactly 100% right, David. I think in the universities, you know, it no, varies they exactly from that. school They say, when do school. I get my show back? I need my show back. Like, like doing the tech is not part of their show. It's like a separate entity. You know, I, I, I've heard that a lot as well, Steve. I'm so glad I don't work with directors like that. <laughs> I just am because it's, I mean, if there's no joy and again, it has a lot to do with the competency of the designer. You're right, Steve. Students are having a difficult time and I'm not, again, there's some things they have to take notes on. And the fact is, is that in, in, in universities, they could work for hours by themselves. Again, I don't know how, you know, what, what good that's going to do because you're just lighting a floor at the time, unless you have light walkers. Uh, but it's, uh, they need to learn how to do it in the profession because that's the way it's done. I still do shows that I get no lighting time. I light it over rehearsals because it's so expensive. It's so expensive. And, you know, I mean, that's what I did at the, at the Royal Opera House. I didn't have any lighting time in there. And that was a huge show. Now, yeah, I did some previs on that to get the basic looks. But boy, all those cues I wrote over rehearsal. Well, I think what happens is when you've been doing it for a while, you, you know where you're going. I mean, the difference is you're a designer with a big D as opposed to designer with little D or designette. I, when I started, junior, I, third class. when I started, I, that's how I lit shows. I rarely I had time because they can't afford it. These small companies, these small companies don't can't afford it. Well, and if you're working with the dance company, uh, you can't go back and revisit the thing three or four times because the dancers are physically not able to do it. They're exhausted. That's right. They're tired. Right. So you've got to you've got to work as they're working and then move on to the next piece. OK, so Stan has our next question. Evelyn in Canada writes, does pouncing your gel really accomplish anything? I just know that when I stomp on mine really, really hard <laughs> and, I get, and, and, I, and I get my sneaker dust on the gel, I get this beautiful diffused quality out of it that I really enjoy. No, I think what we're talking about is using a pounce wheel and putting perforating some holes into the gel, into the color medium, which was done back in the day. I haven't seen anybody do that in a long time. I think it was done for this reason that... The early filters like Roscoline, people have probably never heard of Roscoline. You guys, the Lumen Brothers have heard of it. But, but that stuff, basically the dye or the color was layered on the outside of the, of the plastic. And it would burn up and heat up and dissipate and, you, and it would burn out fast. So by helping the uh, heat uh, that's being uh, uh, concentrated in the gel, in the, in the acetate, you know, you sort of let that heat out by letting some air pass through it. When Roscoe Lux came along and other, what they call deep dyed or basically the entire uh, substance that is the, that is the filter has got the color medium throughout it. It didn't have that problem. So I think pouncing to quote Steve Woods, it's gone the way of the dodo bird. <laughs> I don't think we need that anymore. Evelyn, it never worked. Really, it didn't it work. It never worked. <laughs> it never did. I mean, it was a. It was sort of one of those. What do they call those? Uh, uh, a a legend, right? So yeah, some no, kind no. of uh, urban, 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 urban myth. Urban, it's an urban. It was, myth. A, dissertation, an urban it was myth. a dissertation project somewhere. <laughs> Total urban myth of pouncing. Well, gels. but it let me explain those two different types of gel, anyway. So oh well, go. yeah, like, but it's an obsolete thing. So why are we even talking about it? I don't you know, know. <laughs> Evelyn. We asked the question. <laughs> Evelyn, get some LED fix. <laughs> That's all I got to say. We'll have to hook up Evelyn with Campbell. That guy's ahead of me, and he's 14. And Steve has our last question. Ryan in Illinois writes, I need you to settle an argument. At the gig, do you close the latches on your road boxes backstage? 
Or just, what the hell or just before from? they go into the truck? Like, what does of, he mean? Uh, no. <laughs> no, of, of course not. <laughs> no. <laughs> sit down, sit down. Get, sit down, dude. He's, at the, he's, at the, he's at the gig. <laughs> no, I mean, I know what you're saying, Ryan. Hell yes, I closed the latches on my cases. Because if those latch, how many times has some moron left a latch oh. open on an empty case? Ouch. And you walk by Ouch. and you like destroy your leg or you rip your pants. Yes. Or you cut yes. yourself. Yes. Absolutely. I've been cut on those things. So, yeah, I absolutely. The latch goes back on and, and, and locks down. You know, I would, I would say that it depends on what's in it because, you know, you could be storing stuff in there. So not only that I would, I would latch it, I would lock it because <laughs> I don't want anybody going into that road box because that's where the secret stash is. You don't want you anyone know, getting you, there. <laughs> if you really want to impress your friends down at the club and they think you're completely anal, uh, get yourself some tape or get yourself a red dot. Um, every, when, a ca- when a case comes off and it is empty and closed, stick a red dot on it and just tell people a red dotted case is empty. Or you could just take a, a piece smart. of tape and put an E on it. That's really smart so, because how many times smart. have you heard, damn, where is that gel cutter, right? And you're <laughs> yes, looking at yeah, all right. those damn, all the, case, all the cases at the case. They say, yeah. hey, here's David Stash. I should have locked that one. <laughs> That's funny. Well, the rocking sounds of the Luminoids tells us that once again, you've spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on Spotify, iTunes, Google, YouTube, Live Design Online, and just about every other podcast site out there. Check out our website on lighttalk.org for future guests, and be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However... If you decide to litigate us, the law firm Reflect Flocked Flare and Glare and their little paralegal snoot will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers, coming to you from Long Beach, Gainesville, and from deep in the heart of Texas. And be sure to join us next week when we talk about more crazy happenings in our crazy industry. All of that and a new sponsor. Light Talk, broadcasting questionable lumen knowledge and humor around the world. So we'll see you all next Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Light Talk. Mm-hmm.